so I'll practice what I preach. This is going to be a very hands-on session about writing, about helping students, giving them the kind of feedback that helps them improve their writing. And so we have brought with us the experts in the field, three faculty members from College Writing, John Hyman, who will moderate the panel, Karan Martinez, who has wonderful ideas about helping other faculty, uh, grading papers, teaching writing, helping students to improve their writing, and Lacey Wooten, who is also an expert who has taught me just about everything I know about grading papers and giving students beneficial feedback. So this will be a very hands-on session, a lot of very practical strategies that you can take back to your courses. We have a lot of handouts, and now you know uh, where the experts live, and you can contact them at any point. While we're doing the session, please feel free to get more food, and we will have a Q&A all the way through. Thank you. Good, thanks. Hi, welcome. And now that you know who we are, I think there's a small enough number of us in the room that um, perhaps quickly we can just go around and, and do a, a quick round of introductions. And if you tell us uh, your department, um, perhaps some of us can get to know each other. <coughs> Why don't we start right here? I'm Pilar McKay. I'm in the Division of Public Communications in the School of Communications. Scott Tallon in Division of Public Communication in the School of Communication. Uh, John Curry. I t uh, taught in creative writing here, and I also teach in Maryland academic and professional writing. Sherburne Lachlan in Arts Management, and I teach grant writing and other applied kinds of writing. I'm Lucas, and I work in CTRL. I'm Trisha, and I also work at CTRL. <laughs> I'm Colette, also CTRL. <laughs> and Marilyn Goldhammer, CTRL, and I also teach in the School of Education, Teaching, and Health. Good. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> we intend, by the way, for this to be uh, deductive, moving first from a couple of very modest general propositions that I want to put on the table to some more specific suggestions as we go forward. Um, our hope is that you know, around about an hour from now, you'll leave the room thinking, oh, that's one or two or three things I could do starting you know, tomorrow when it comes to assigning writing, valuing writing in our classrooms, and probably mostly to the point, responding to the writing that our students do. Some people say they relish reading student essays and grading. Not just that remarkable student paper that coaxes you to get up out of your chair and read an excerpt of it to your partner, but really, they say they enjoy the whole process of it. I take those people to either be lying or to be delusional. <laughs> um, um, in fact, and please at the end grab handouts. One of them is uh, uh, an old saw that's been posted online often, the five stages of grading, borrowing from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief, walking one through what one feels when on a Friday night you go home with a briefcase filled with papers. Talks like this are supposed to open with something catchy. I'm going to do something opposite to that, opening with something ordinary and obvious, but I think which gets right to the heart of the matter. A student was quoted recently in a study done at Indiana State University when it came to student response to teacher response. And he said this, I like it when the teacher tells you what the problem is and there is actually a criterion. Again, it sounds like a modest proposition, but he gets right to the heart of it. He reminds me, in fact, of the 1956 baseball novel by Mark Harris, Bang the Drum Slowly. In it, Harris chronicles a baseball season of the mythical New York Mammoths. The veteran players on the team play a card game called Tegwar. It's designed to win money from both fans, hangers-on in hotel lobbies, and from rookies in the clubhouse. The point of the game is that the veterans are making up the rules and parlance of the game as they go, inventing phrases like, that's a natural banjo, or that's a double honeybee, or 
even more counterintuitively, no, no, integuar 15 plus 15 equals 32. And of course, the hustle is that the initiate does well at the beginning. He'll play a card without even knowing why he's playing it, and the response will be, I thought you said you never played Teguar. That's a double honeybee. It's all nonsense, of course. And at the end of the evening, the initiate is relieved of the money in his wallet. <coughs> Teguar is an acronym for the exciting game without any rules. Student Students writing and handing in their work to us for our judgment should not feel like a game of teguar. That, that kid at Indiana State, he was saying that writing and getting evaluated sometimes feels just that way. Um, it's one of the reasons why in the college writing program we work from a consistent grading rubric. And again, you can grab a copy of this uh, uh, at your leisure today. You can also, and I think we may have almost enough copies, grab a copy of this. It is the book that is required of all first year students taking the required writing courses in our college writing program. It's a customized version of Andrea Lunsford's book, Easy Writer. We don't like the title of the book either. <laughs> but, but we like the book. Um, it gives us a consistent vocabulary, and the first 32 pages of this book provide uh, information that is specific to the American University College Writing Program for students, including, in fact, a copy of the grading rubric I mentioned. It might be tempting to think, well, if you've got a grading rubric, that takes all the complicatedness out of it, right? No, it's not even remotely uncomplicated. Uh, my, my page uh, began with the phrase, notes on grading and responding, but it's impossible to talk about grading and responding without talking about just about every other element of our teaching. One can't talk about grading without talking about comments, assignment constructions, and you're going to hear more about that today, interpersonal dynamics, in short, a conversation about grading becomes a conversation about our operating pedagogies, whether we're aware of those pedagogies or not. So, we can't talk about grading without talking about everything else, and we can't talk about everything else <coughs> without talking about the dynamics of grading. I want to dispel one notion, though, about grading and responding to student writing, that it is somehow distinct from even antithetical to teaching. I hear colleagues say things like, I really love teaching, but I hate the grading. They're not separate enterprises. Um, as one attempt to demystify what are the best practices in responding to student writing, I'd ask you to think about the scene in your office. When a student comes to you with a draft of a paper and wants to talk about it, think of what you would say to the student in that moment, in that scene. That's probably closer to a productive assessing voice than a sentencing judge's voice, which is sometimes what students hear on papers. Our role as graders and, and judges then does not have to run counter to our roles as teachers and coaches. Lil Brannon, uh, uh, an essayist in our field, said this, the purpose of any commentary is first to dramatize the presence of teacher as concerned readers, second to instill in writers that they too must be active readers of their own texts, a distant third to explain why the kid got a B minus. A student from a study at Harvard on student response to comments said this, too many teachers' comments are written to the paper, not to the student. Now that might seem like a puzzle or a false distinction, but I think, think it suggests a real shift from teacher-centered directives to a dialogue between writer and reader. Nancy Summers of Harvard calls this the teacher-student partnership. Again, think about that moment in your office. When you were reading over a paper with a, with a student sitting five feet away from you, both with a cup of coffee in your hand, would you come to a phrase in that paper and caw like a crow, ah? No, you wouldn't. Unless you were doing it just to get the laugh that I just got. You wouldn't do that. You would perhaps pause and say, 
I'm not positive I'm following you here. It seemed like we were talking about this, and now we're talking about this other thing. Where did you want to go in this moment in the paper? That's what you'd say. You'd, in fact, act like an actual human being in that moment. That's closer to the kinds of response that are effective and productive for students on their writing. We should think then about grading and commenting as an opportunity to teach. Peter Elbow, a leader in our field, said this, I make the standards explicit, and then I act wholly as the ally of the student to achieve success. He says, I'll be a kind of lawyer for your defense. A couple of final notes before I turn it over. Fundamentally, it seems to me that the way we respond to student work is an issue of student rights. Because they have the right to transparency, consistency, and instruction. Students need to know where you're coming from as a teacher. And they need to know that you're not coming from a peculiar place. I, I want to pause and say I'm not for a second suggesting that we all become one. We all have our own you know, uh, uh, priorities. We certainly all have our own language pet peeves. I will, <laughs> till the end of my days, uh, uh, be bothered by the student who use, uses words like literally and correctly, or my current one is uh, uh, students who mistake the word honing for the word homing. But that's just me. In general, though, I hope I make sure to students that I'm not representing John Hyman's pet peeve box, but rather I'm representing something called effective persuasive writing. And that we're going to work towards something that will be rewarded in the next class and the next class and beyond. <coughs> so let me be utterly reductive and give just a quick handful of one-line hints. Clarify your criteria in advance, and the grading criteria should, as we're going to learn, echo the stated criteria on the assignments. Avoid comments that seem generic and interchangeable. Write to the student in front of you. Include what is called in the literature, and it's an awkward phrase, an authentic response in the paper. By authentic response, um, we mean uh, uh, the moment when you seem to take off your teacher hat and act as an actual reader without a say in how the paper's going. This morning I was reading a paper about pop music and wrote in the margin, I saw Springsteen in 78. It took me five seconds to write that line on the paper. But I know that the effect of it is that the student's going to see that in the margin and realize, oh, I've got like an engaged reader here. He's paying attention to what I'm doing. So I don't do it to get credit for seeing Springsteen in 78, though I did. I do it so that the student will listen to the next comment I write in the margin that may have to do with organization or some such. This next one's a little tricky. Find something to like in the paper and actually like it. Uh, it it's sort of a believing game, again, to quote Peter Elbow. And finally, check with students. Um, the way one responds should be part of a dialogue one has with students. Uh, I'll often, either anonymously, through a, some kind of a survey or the like, ask students, you know, is, are the responses you're getting from me on your work helpful? How could they be more helpful? Would it be better if we did X, Y, and Z? I want them to know that you know, there's nothing written in stone about the way paper one gets returned. I want them involved in that decision so that they can become engaged readers and engaged writers. But I've gone on way too long. I want to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Lacey Wooten. So to follow on that, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, slightly, slightly more specific. You'll find that we're going to get a little more particular as we go along here. Um, you know, I think we're all here because we all know that writing is important. I think you wouldn't get any argument about that across the university at all, that writing matters, um, certainly, and not just in the university either, but beyond the university, certainly. Students understand this too. You know, they, they, if you ask them, they've been well trained in why writing is important. Um, you know, they know that they need it for their jobs. They know that they'll increasingly need it for their jobs as, as times change. Um, um, they know they live in a text-focused world. Did I make a noise? Um, they 
know they live in a text-focused world, too. You know, they're immersed in text. It's not like students never write. They always write. They're constantly writing. Um, so they know that, and they also even know that writing aids in learning and understanding. They've been taught that in middle school and high school. So the importance of writing is not in any way an unfamiliar concept to them. So then that brings us to the question is why do we often feel like student writing is so flawed? If they know why it's, it's, that it's that important, then why can't they do it better? Right? And that's sort of the, 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 the perplexing question. I think one reason that we often forget, especially as the semester gets hectic and difficult, is that they're students. They're learning to write just as they're learning to do everything else. And they're not only learning to write, they're learning to write in SPA. They're learning to write in public communications. They're learning to write in SIS. They're learning to write in all these different worlds all at the same time. One of the things I tell my students when we talk about genre conventions, because that's sort of a foundational idea in, our, in my course, is that they have it, it's much tougher for them than it is for their professors. Each of us writes in our field. Students have to go out and write in five different fields or six different fields. We don't have to do that. Every time they walk into a different classroom, they have to learn a different way to write. And they're all new at it while they're doing it too. So it's tremendously challenging for them. And so I think we have to demand a lot of them, but also not get really upset when they struggle and when they flounder because they're going to. They're novices at this, um, no matter how bright they may be. They're still novices. Um, I think the other reason, too, that their writing can be weak is that students don't see the ways that people across the university value writing. I do firmly believe that everybody, pretty much everybody in the university believes writing is important. Students often don't get that message. They don't know that other people besides their writing instructors think writing is important. Um, students are efficient. <laughs> they'll do what they believe is required. And if you don't tell them it's required and that it's important, they're not going to do it. You know, that's, that's the way they operate. And I think one of, my, one of our colleagues calls them the efficiency generation. Because they're all about maximizing the time. They're, they're busy. They have a lot of stuff going on. So they're going to figure out strategies for getting things done as quickly as possible. And if one of those is not really worrying about the organization of a paper, because the pa professor hasn't made it clear that it's important, then they're not going to worry about it. You know, they've got other things on their plate. So I, so I think that's, that's another reason. If they think it's not required or that it isn't important in the eyes of that authority figure, then they're not going to pay as much attention to it. And they tell us repeatedly in our writing classes, again and again, they tell us, you guys are the only ones who care about this stuff. Meaning, grammar, organization. Um, clear documentation of sources, transitions. I know that's not true. I know that they're wrong, but they're getting that impression somewhere. Because they're quite attuned to what the authority figures around them want. So somewhere they're getting that, they're getting that idea. Um, so what to do about this then? What to do about this kind of um, communication gap and the fact that we have novice writers that we're trying to bring along. Um, and it's difficult and challenging for them. One of the hurdles for us is that teaching writing and evaluating writing takes a lot of time. And the temptation, I think, can be, on, on our part, can be our own version of efficiency. How can we get through the damn papers as quickly as possible? <laughs> and get onto something else that maybe we want to do more than that. Um, so I think we need, as John said, I think we need to kind of resist that impulse. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently is how do we retain or recapture a sort of human element of communication that goes on in this grading, evaluating transaction? How do we prevent ourselves from getting into the role of error counters or scolds or people who see a paper as a cluster of problems that somehow need to be responded to? How do we get back to what writing really is, which is communication from one human being to another, and how to foster that? Um, and I think that there are impulses within ourselves, and I think there are institutional factors at work that are pushing us away from that human interaction. Um, so we need to recognize our own time needs, our own need for some efficiency, because right, we have other pressures too, while not losing that human element that is 
the potential, I think, to make it a less um, onerous process. So I have three things to suggest, and they, they echo some of the things that John said. Um, the first one is for us to be efficient and strategic in our writing instruction. For example, and, and I'm addressing this really in terms of people who are not writing faculty, um, because we have not all the time in the world, but certainly more time than you all do to really get into a lot of detail about writing. Um, so, efficient and strategic. One is, you don't have time to teach them everything, so teach them something, right? For example, do a mini lesson that's 10 minutes on how to craft a strong thesis statement or what constitutes a credible research source. You can cover that again very quickly in just a small segment of your class. Um, another thing that's very strategic and efficient, provide one substantive comment per page. You don't have to write all over it to do the kind of thing that John's talking about. Give them one comment per page. We often err on the side of too much comment, where we're covering the students' papers. That's not good pedagogically either. Sometimes less is more. So say, I don't follow, don't say org. You know, say, I don't follow your train of thought here. Look again at the organization of ideas in this paragraph. Use I statements, respond as a reader, but do that once per page. That's not really time consuming. Pick one paragraph or one page to really get in to the sentence level and style errors. You don't have to mark the whole paper. Odds are good they're making the same mistakes over and over again throughout. Why mark them 20 times? So pick a paragraph and go to town on it. You don't have to do it on the whole paper. Um, and then devise a rubric that will help you do synthesized comments and comments to help students pull the feedback together. If all you're giving them are those discrete margin comments, students are going to see them discreetly. They're going to see them as individual moments that if they fix this thing on page two, the paper will be better. So you need to give them something that's going to synthesize, but develop a rubric that will help you do that. You don't have to write pages and pages. You can use stock responses and adapt them for that particular paper. So that's one way, I think, in terms of feedback to work more efficiently. In conjunction with that, make your expectations clear up front, as John said. Don't spring it on them later. I, I think of my assignments as a contract, honestly. Um, if I don't tell students to do something, I can't get all pissed off when they haven't done it later, if it's important to me. <coughs> I need to let them know it's an expectation. So, so make it clear. Emphasize writing in your assignment sheet. You know, devote a section of your assignment sheet to what really matters to you. And think both globally and locally. Again, if you put on there, boy, comma splices drive me crazy, and I'm going to flunk your paper if you have comma splices, that student, being an efficient creature, will spend, what, 80% of the time on that paper making sure there are no comma splices. But that's not the only thing you care about in that paper. Right? So represent your priorities in those expectations. And don't create a fill-in-the-blanks assignment. If you have too many expectations, that student will have no ownership, no agency. They're going to just fill in the blanks. And what kind of paper, you know, are you really going to want to read that later? Somebody who's filled out a form? Right? So make your expectations clear while giving them the room to be intellectually creative, to be innovative, to have authenticity and ownership and agency. There is a balance there. Um, last, and this one to me is the toughest, but it's also the most interesting. Think about the role of writing in your discipline. How does writing function in your discipline? And that can be at a very basic level. What are the genres that are prevalent in your discipline? What are the disciplinary conventions? What's the documentation style? And why does that matter? What values do those things represent? in terms of the thinking and the work in your discipline. But more complexity, how are conversations and arguments conducted in texts? <coughs> how do people engage with other perspectives in a work in your discipline? Which kinds of approaches are valid and which aren't? Some disciplines value case studies, others don't. Um, how present is the author and why? Some disciplines expect I, some disciplines allow I, 
very few, far fewer than students realize, forbid I. So how prevalent is the author in this? Do authors use headings? Is there a kind of organization? Why? What are the common moves? So think about how can you convey the values and priorities of your discipline through the nature of the writing. And even though that's tough, I think this is the place now where we can start to recapture that human element. Because now we don't have a bundle of errors, we have authentic work within the discipline that you can respond to one member of the discipline, potentially a novice, but who also is another member of the discipline. So, hand over to Tom. Great. So, my role now is to put some flesh on these bones that Lacey and John have talked about. And I'd like to do that with a couple of examples from my teaching and my pedagogy. So, um, could I ask you to, to hand these out? <coughs> Coming around is an assignment prompt for an assignment that I do in my Lit 100. So this is the gateway course for a lot of our new freshmen. It's an annotated bibliography, and it's the middle of three linked assignments. Uh, it follows from what John and Lacey said in terms of really setting up our expectations for the finished product and for continuing to establish a, a common glossary or vocabulary. So I want to pull your attention to the kind of thinking that goes on up front when you're designing your assignments. Uh, think about it in terms of different sections that are highlighted for the student. What's the purpose of this assignment? What is the professor expecting me to achieve? It's a nice way to start. Um, if you have particular conventions to this assignment, to your discipline, to write those out in terms of guidelines, a sort of a list for students to know that they've attended to all of the things that you're thinking about. I like the, the very audience-friendly tips where you're in an advisory sort of role. You're able to offer examples. Uh, in my class, I like to get my students out into Washington, D.C., so I ask them to visit and then write about a Washington, D.C. landmark of some kind. So here, I'm asking them, in the context of memory and commem commemoration, um, how do you find something new to extend the conversation about one of these monuments or memorials in DC? Flipping the page is, a, is an opportunity to underscore some of the practical work that we're doing in the classroom. What is an annotated bibliography? Again, these are scholars who are new to this academic conversation. The annotated bibliography or the literature review is common to a number of our disciplines. Um, what are the expectations of, of this form? What's one way to do that that they could then adapt to an international politics course or a communications course or even a, a literature review in a, in a biology course? So this talks about uh, underscoring that actual practice that we're doing in the uh, classroom and is a little bit of a, of a summary reminder. And finally, especially as Lacey was mentioning, evaluation. How is the professor going to look at this assignment? What, what discrete priorities does the professor have for what I need to produce? And here I've done this in a kind of a question checklist. Again, as a friendly reminder, have you remembered to do all these things uh, before you've turned it in? And then in the second handout that you can see, uh, it's an actual copy of some of my feedback. And here, what I've done um, is to adapt some of the ideas that John talks about. You've got the rubric, so that little table up top has gone back and is mirroring everything in the evaluation portion of the prompt and allowed me a chance to comment on the right-hand side. Then, as John was mentioning, not losing sight of the fact that this is a person and this is an act of communication, I'm writing a short letter. To, to the person. So here, here's Amy, and leading with praise, I'm impressed by the quality and variety of your sources. So a little bit what you've done well, what you've done right. Um, and I'm trying to mirror back an appreciation for what the attempt is in, in, this, in this paper. In this case, the student was writing about the FDR memorial and bringing in information about how, when it was an, uh, opened in the early 90s, there was quite an uproar that he was not in a wheelchair. And so disability activists and psychologists and 
quite that scholarly body weighed in about what that means in terms of commemorating the legacy of that president. Um, echoing what Lacey says, you can see in the third paragraph of the short letter that I've divided my feedback into that idea of global and local. So in the global, I'm really engaging with the project of what the writer is trying to say. Um, so I pose two questions at the conclusion in the margin. What would FDR himself have thought of his depiction in a wheelchair when he fought so hard to hide his disability from the public? I don't actually know the answer to that question. It's something to, for the student to continue to expand on and think about. Um, growing from that, I write, in terms of political correctness, who decides the legacy of a president and how we commemorate him? Is that up to the family? Is that up to historians? Is that up to the public? Who, who has ownership of that? So again, an idea with no clear answer, but having the student, having done the work, to then grow these larger questions. But then, in terms of our job is also about correctness and style, on the local side, I see how much you try to eliminate passive voice, and I applaud that. And that's the kind of comment you can really only make if you're seeing students as individuals and you're seeing their writing as a process. And this was actually improved from an earlier essay where there was just passive voice all over the place and explaining why that was not a great choice. Um, so I say you still have some work to do here and we need to attack some patterns of phrasing that I marked as awkward <laughs> in your text. I really recommend reading aloud as one revision technique to catch that you'd quickly tag the awkwardness because you don't speak that way. And then I finish with a kind of raw, keep going, uh, Professor Martinez. Now, so what you may be thinking, that looks like a tremendous amount of work. Okay, so the rubric actually really helps to say, you can also just, I have yes, and then a bit of a comment. You can just say yes, see the, see the text. The doing it uh, on the computer enables you to start to have stock phrases, no joke, to cut and paste when some of the issues are the same. Of course, personalizing it when necessary and needed, the part about onward questions and to their particular memorial. The other thing to be careful of here is that students look at each other's comments. So you don't want to be seen as the cookie cutter, fill in the blank responder either. But to some extent they understand that if passive voice is an issue or comma splices or problems with MLA or APA documentation, that that's going to be a kind of a stock uh, response so that you can um, save some of this information from, from time to time. Um, to make this now is an exercise that you all can engage in, Lacey, for a talk that we did earlier, um, broke this down into a worksheet with possible assignment sheet components. So make sure you grab one of these if this is an idea that you like. Um, where you're making the, um, it's sort of connected with the rubric here, I'll take that off. Um, I have copies of the rubric if we want to. If we want to pass those around. Okay. And so, yeah. so to sum up, and to quickly get this oh, okay. to, the, to the conversation stage. Me too, apparently. <laughs> um, just to say, uh, to look at student writing as a conversation, as a way of teaching, um, as a way of, of communicating with that student as a person, um, while trying to regularize as much of your work as you can, um, really turns out to be a winner for, um, for students seeing writing as a process, not just in your class, but in other ways and other disciplines and conventions as well. And, and if I can just add a, a suffix to <coughs> what both Karan and, and Lacey have said, um, lest there be any confusion, we in the college writing program value correctness. Oh, boy, do we value correctness. But let me say this. If students begin to think that that's all we value, that's all they're going to value. You know, what's, what's the old line? If your only tool is a hammer, everything, every problem begins to look like a nail. Well, if your only tool is to comment about, you know, pure technical malfeasance, that's all the student will attend to. Um, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with, um, it's, it, it's a terrific video, it's now uh, several years old, um, and I can't, rem I can't give the attribution because I can't remember, but the video comes on and there's six people in the foreground, there are two balls, and the question is simply, 
Let's see if you can pay attention. Count how many times the people in the blue shirt pass the ball. So, as human beings, we've now been given a task, and oh boy, do we count. We, I remember, the, I, I was a sucker for this the first time I saw it. And I was very proud of myself when I, I think it was like 47 or something. And I got the answer right. And the screen at the end, it's 47, did you get it right? And while I was patting myself on the back, the screen reads, but did you see the dancing gorilla? And I didn't. And in fact, I disbelieved that there was a dancing gorilla. And then they played it again. And there he was. <laughs> if all I'm looking for is a broken sentence or three, that's all <coughs> I'll find. And that's not, I think, what we want to communicate to students. And you know, I think we can have it both ways. I think we can insist on correctness. When we tell students stories of, you know, anonymously, <laughs> The uh, letter of application that comes in with two typos in the first paragraph and the application got rejected because of those two typos, anecdotes like that underscore the importance of correctness. But if that's all we say, they're going to be typo hunters instead of writers. So I just wanted to add that. I like talking about that video too because if you haven't, I saw a couple of nods around the room. If you haven't seen it, by all means, it's just terrific. It's Dan Simons. He's from University of Illinois, and it's called The Invisible Gorilla, and he has a book about it, and it's amazing. Wow. It's just, and right, and you don't see the gorilla. Yeah. It's inattentional blindness. That's what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> I guess, Marilyn, we have time for Q and A, or yes, and probably the. The Jewish mother in me wants to say, please eat your food. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad we mentioned first person, because I find that students often are fearful of the first person. And I don't, I don't, I'm trying to understand why that is. And this connects to another question. In an upper division class, what should we as faculty expect that they know how to do in writing? What have they had to take? And, and what should they be able to do? Because that helps us do better assignments, I think, instead of just more basic stuff. Um, why don't I answer the first question and you can answer it the second? Perfect. Um, I think they're fearful of I because of us, I mean us as a body, and because they're high school teachers. They're high school teachers that beat into their head, never, ever, ever use I, scholarly writing never has I. But you know, I'll tell you, I, um, I, I encourage my students to use I, I teach them how to use it as it's used in a scholarly article where it's often used for meta-commentary early on to lay out the project, to provide a roadmap. You see it all the time in scholarly articles. It's, it's just silly to say we don't use it. Um, and yet, I have a, a colleague in SIS who's a good who's a good friend, but we've argued about this. And I've said, you know, because my students in SIS, they all all my professors <coughs> say never use I. No one, and they and they are students are told scholars in SIS don't use I. And you know, I've said to this friend of mine, I have read SIS scholarly articles that use I. It's simply false. And she said, I know. But I tell them not to use it anyway. Um, and so I think if we can't overcome, like, this goes back to what does the, the discipline genuinely do, right? If we're not willing to embrace the actual functions and conventions of our own disciplines and, and let students be a part of those, then we can never expect them, I think, to do the kind of writing we want them to do because they'll always be outsiders. They'll always be students. They'll never be genuine participants. Um, I do have, um, there's a, I'm, I was looking for a board for a minute, of course I have it. There's a wonderful <laughs> website called writingspaces.org. One word, writingspaces.org. It is an open access writing textbook. The authors are leaders in the field of composition. Um, it's written for students. One of the essays, Scott, is called I Need You to Use I. Yeah. And she talks about what are, the, what are the scholarly conventions for using I. Um, and when don't you use it? So for, for my students, that is a life-changing moment <laughs> to read that. I have a student say, we've been told not to use I. Right. Right. They have been. They have been. So um, now we have faculty in conflict. Right. Right. Well, it sounds like it's some of both, mm -hmm. you know, the appropriate uses. So I like the writing spaces thing because mm -hmm. it's like when you use it, when you not. And right. How do you walk that line, which is harder to do, but right, it is, it is. But they they can do it. Um, and you know, I do. Uh, 
I always have the caveat with my students, which is in my class, you can do what published writers do in these disciplines. But if you walk into another class and the professor says, never use I, they say, what are you going to do? And they all, you know, say, don't use I. Because it's not worth it, you know? They'll get a bad grade or they won't convince that professor. So, I know, I agree with you, though. I think it, it's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. And if I could just follow on that, when this comes up, and as it inevitably does with first year students, I turn the question back to them. I, I hear you that you've been told not to. Why do you suppose that is? Well, because we've been told not to. No, that's a tautology. <laughs> Tell me why. What's underneath it? Well, it turns out that what's underneath it might be the slightly more sensible, don't write self-indulgent pablum. Right. Right. That's the stuff of navel-gazing. Right. And at that, when the conversation turns to that, I'm the first to say, right, yeah. I I'm against navel-gazing too. But notice how our conversation just turned from the accident of this pronoun to a mode or approach. And they still got to write something worthy of you reading. Yes. So what should students at upper level have learned? When you um, well, I, I, I'm happy to have, with my colleagues, already answered this question. And in fact, I think you know, one benefit of the um, modest attendance today is I think everybody's going to be able to take away a copy of this book with our compliments. And you'll see early in the book, student learning outcomes, Good. where we sketch out in, in quite specific detail, here's what we are aiming for in college writing. Now, let the record show, many students, and Lacey alluded to this, uh, compartmentalize. And so they graduate, if you will, from the two semester sequence in college writing thinking, good, done. Got that covered. And, and so uh, I will always remember our, our old colleague Kay Massell, who tells the story of a quite good student she had a semester she was teaching both a writing course and an American Studies course. And the student was a brilliant writer and handed in great work in the writing course and then handed in, you can see where this is going, a demonstrably poor paper in the American Studies course. And Kay quizzed her about, well, why is, I can see that you're a good writer. Why did you do this? And she said, well, I, I didn't think the writing counted in the American Studies course. That, that's not a student being snide or cynical. That's just a student compartmentalizing. Let's see if we can break up the boundaries a little bit. <laughs> so, not to be heretical or anything, I teach Please. A, a writing for communication course, which is basically journalistic writing. And, oh, journalistic writing. In the first day of um, class, I basically said, forget everything you've learned in every other class, a writing class in college, um, which is kind of a problem <laughs> for me. And this is my first time teaching. So, um, do you have any kind of words of wisdom to kind of break, I mean, I don't want to break them of the habit totally so they'll get to their next class and write, you know, a new story, but in my class, they have to do something very different that they're not used to, so. Well, I, I guess, I, I, I mean, my flip response would be that I disagree with you. Here's what I mean. It's not that they have to reject everything they've been learned. They have to acquaint themselves with the different expectations and different discourse modes whether it be in journalism or international studies or whatever. But much of what we're talking to them about in college writing, everyone in this room would say, yeah, I'm, I'm for that. So I wouldn't be, I guess, quite so quick to uh, try and um, 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 uh, sever the tether. <laughs> well, I'm not, no, I'm not telling them to, you know, that one's better than the other. Right. They have different purposes. And so, like, for instance, I'm telling them I don't want a 10-line paragraph. One-sentence paragraphs are actually better yep. for me. Um, Perfect. But this, is, but this, is a per this is a hard thing for them to kind of grasp. And, you know, and I want shorter words that don't bug try to impress me with, you know, multi-syllabic words. Well, I, I tell them that, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a page out of our book. Yeah. 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 If, if I could jump in for a second, then, what we're really talking about, I think, is really getting this university to understand that writing is this common project with this common vocabulary that we all share. And the more we let on to students that we're all on the same team, by familiarizing ourselves with what we know they've learned in college writing, um, the more we can hold them accountable to cut down those silos and to begin to apply that transfer of knowledge that starts to happen. Because believe me, concision and uh, and uh, correctness logical and logical work. That, that's all of our, in fact, a core idea that we talk about is this idea of audience, context, and purpose. 
So they're trained to think, what does my audience want in this assignment? What's my purpose here? What's the context in which I'm writing? So that it's not a one-size-fits-all template that we're teaching in the college writing program. Um, in teaching uh, grant writing, it's a bit of a persuasive and I'd love to hear your favorite persuasive textbooks, persuasive writing textbooks. Because I don't, I've got all kinds of good, yeah. you know, how, how do you do grants, you know, all that sort of technical right. stuff. But I'd love a really good persuasive writing. Um, one that a lot of us use that looks very simplistic, um, but is not terribly simplistic, is called They Say, I Say, mm -hmm. um, by Gerald Graff and Kathy Bernstein. Um, it's all about um, engaging with other perspectives. Um, it's about the importance of knowing the conversation before you try to step into it and how do you do that. Right. Um, they even, this is where it looks, it looks more simplistic than it is, they even offer templates for, um, not for <coughs> essays, but for individual moments of interaction with sources. So if you're trying to negotiate a complicated relationship with a couple different perspectives, they have like a, a sentence that they could use that, that kind of helps students work through it. So that's one that's a very, um, a very nuts and bolts right. on paper right. kind of thing. There's also Howard Gardner at Harvard right. on yep. persuasion. Right. Not so much on writing, but there's a... Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. It's a good way to structure what, what can you find to persuade people. Yep. Mm -hmm. you know. That's good. Mm -hmm. I forgot that. That's good. And I know how to, how to make <laughs> another how title. To make oh, sorry. How to make it stick? Yeah. Another title that comes to mind is by, in fact, Andrea Lunsford, um, uh, a better title to look, Everything's an Argument, in which she, uh, she traces the way that even innocuous discourse is finally an argument. You're making a point. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yep. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Even what I just said. <laughs> That's right, Scott. <Yeah. laughs> I have a super quick question about the relationship between the writing program and the writing center. Yeah. Uh, so how well synchronized are these two entities or, or programs, and uh, and when one would send students back to the writing center, for example, for for more information or for some assistance? Is that, yeah? How how would that work? Well, we are we are. It, it, I'm searching for the words that will. Um, uh, express the fact that we are indeed in sync. <laughs> the writing center is really of the Department of Literature College Writing Program. Um, the operating pedagogy of both are, are in sync with each other. Um, uh, the writing consultants at the writing center would not be surprised by anything they heard the three of us say this morning. One key aspect of the writing center uh, interaction is that whenever they have a student come in, they have them bring a paper and the prompt right. so that they are in, internalizing this idea of this particular text is a response to certain expectations and will help the student to see the points where he, may, he or she may or may not be fulfilling the expectations of the assignment. So it's a very holistic kind of process and I think that comes out of the, uh, the collegiality, the collaboration that we have. So the clearer the prompt, the Better. Yes, yes. yes. For, for so many ways. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, all of us were students. Remember the time the teacher said, okay, your term paper is due in a month. It should be an analysis of fill in the blank. You, you didn't really know what to do. You took a shot, right. and but I, it was guesswork. And I want to add, too, this does not mean that we don't have the student who comes to our office hours and says, so what do you want us to do in this paper? Right. <laughs> exactly. That's something yeah. Of course. Yeah. So following up on the Writing Center thing, and I just love your insight on this, what do you think the Writing Center does best? And I have students come back and tell me all of their opinions and stuff, like they're really good on this, and they're really good on this. So from your perspective, because then I could send them appropriately to the Writing Center. Because they only have an hour. I mean, they don't have, you know, Here's what the Writing Center does. It animates, for that 45 minutes, a disinterested reader. I'm using that word precisely, not uninterested, a disinterested reader. This is not somebody who has particularly a stake in how that paper is going to work out, and the student knows that. So the conversation can often be m richer and more attuned to uh, what the student's 
hopes and dreams for that paper are. Um, but let me, but a little more specifically, yeah. um, my sense is from talking to my students who go, they tend to get the most out of it when they bring in a draft that they have particular problems with. And whether it's organization, or how to proceed with the argument, how to work with the argument. And, and when they go then and they can talk that through with someone, the writing center will do more than that, sure. but my experience has been that students get the most out of it when they have that something on paper and they need some help working through it yeah. with, with kind of an outside perspective. I wanted to add to the <coughs> important resource for us here is the library. And so for instance, in all of our college writing sessions, we have partner librarians who I don't think it's an exaggeration to say are our co-teachers. So they also have our assignment prompts, our syllabi. They get to know our students, not just in a one-size-fits-all library session, but throughout. It's not unusual for us to meet up with our librarians two times, sometimes even three more. So that's another research uh, resource for students because sometimes their problems are synthesizing sources, finding appropriate sources, and can't us underestimate the power of the faculty member to say, use your library sources, ask a librarian, chat, stop in at the reference desk, run your search words and your keywords through them as well. And the, the advantage there is they start to see that this writing project is all of a piece. It's the writing center, it's their teachers, it's the uh, conventions of the discipline, and it's the information literacy side as well. Two questions. What are your thoughts on longer versus shorter? <laughs> and then the other one is, is anyone in the room, my handwriting, to be honest, is really sloppy. So I'm trying to do stuff, either voice recorded that transcribes. I could type, but I'm, I'm curious if anyone's used anything other than handwritten and what that is. Um, so longer versus shorter papers? Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, um, <clears throat> I've actually changed, I don't know if this really applies to what you asked about or not, but over the past few years, I've radically changed the way I approach my courses. I used to have do a number of, uh, the papers would, would grow over the course of the semester. You know, so we'd start with four to six, and then we'd go to six to eight, and then we'd go to 10 to 12, and they'd write three papers that gradually got longer. So I was kind of building on that, right? Now, everything is really geared towards one long paper, and they do short assignments along the way to build towards that. Um, so I give them homework that will give them the skill to write concisely and in a very focused way, but I think in terms of what they need my support for the most, it's the longer papers where they have to sustain and develop an argument because that's where things fall apart, right? Is if it's, if it's over four to six pages, that's where they start to lose coherence, they start to lose organization, they lose their focus and train of thought. Um, so I think I, I, I want them to know how to get out that short paper, because they're going to need it in your classes, they're going to need it in the working world, right? I want them to be able to express their ideas clearly and directly. But where I think my teaching matters the most is for that longer paper. Does that answer your question? It, it was very open. It does, <laughs> also the, the, the discipline, and that it does depend on the discipline. Right, right. Yeah. right. absolutely. I think right. there has been a bias for longer papers in academia, mm -hmm. and we, right. we've had to do it, so we adopt it now that we're teachers. Right. And sometimes it gets into the puffery and the blah, 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 just right. because I think someone arbitrary page decision. Right. Right. Which I don't want either. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you're going to get more of it potentially with a longer paper. Right. That you pull it in. And a short paper, they can't afford, right. they can't afford it because they're, they're going to run out of anything to say. Right. I want to have my cake and eat it, too. That's, that's what I want. <laughs> that's my goal. Right. I, I think in my class, Scott, what I try to tell people is um, shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs. So even if the overall paper is eight to 10 pages, but how readable is that prose to get cut down on wordiness and to cut down on this fake passive voice sort of authoritarian sounding prose is another way to think about that. Thank you. Um, two of our colleagues in the literature department, Rachel Snyder and Mandy Berry, have both experimented with giving feedback orally. Uh, I don't know the particulars the of it with the recorded feedback, yeah. like a podcast. Really? So I would think that they wouldn't mind if you contacted them. Yeah, Rachel, Rachel did a workshop for us on it. So Rachel Snyder would be a good person for you. Yeah, and, awesome. and I can give you a one-liner from that workshop that it's, it's ingenious. Um, Rachel is herself often um, a, a 
commentator on NPR, and so she she knows she comes by this <laughs> advice honestly. When you're giving your feedback orally, uh, recorded and then uh, given to the to the student, smile as you're speaking your words. When she said that, I thought it was a joke, and then she sort of acted out the difference in tone when you're smiling versus not. And I'll be damned. It makes a difference, and I confess it changed the way I listen to NPR now because I realized, <laughs> oh, they're smiling when they're doing these scripted pieces. It also connects on your thing and others about writing to the student at the paper. Yep. This is why I'm willing to try it. It's more personal. Yeah. It's to them. Right, that's In, true. Right, it's a conversation. Right. I have a good app for you, too, by the way, that I can share with everyone. What's it called? It's, it's annotation through the Google Docs, like oral annotation. add on this uh, as somebody who teaches the academic writing in your division. Um, We're colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> what I have found effective is using a page minimum, not a page maximum. Yeah. Uh, I'll say minimum six pages, and what I find is that the students, if they're engaged with the topic, will write above that. Um, I think in our division it's very uh, unusual that we teach professional and business writing as well as how do you engage with your discipline. So we have issues with okay, this is an assignment for the public, this is an assignment for a research audience, right, this right. is a research for academia. Sure. And they look at me like, "How did? what are you talking about? And it's like, well, I've done all three of those. So it's a real personal set, way to say, I've had to develop all of those voices because we write as communicators. So, um, yeah, the page minimum works for me. I don't know, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I do find, I mean, I, I ask for my final paper, you know, I'll usually say around 10 to 12 pages. Most of them give me papers that are 14 to 16. That actually, I had, and they're, they're substantive all the way through. Um, but you know, then again, they're, they're engaging with multiple scholarly articles. Um, they have a project they've worked on all semester. Um, so it's not, there is, there is substance there. You know? but, but I agree, and I think that if they're engaged, they'll go further. No courier new, please. Right. Oh, God, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> And I mean, I think we could all, we all probably sing the same tune in telling students not to fetishize size. Um, I have a standard line that, you know, I've read five page papers that were way too long, and I've read 12 page papers that were way too short. Right. Yeah. Did you want to mention Master Summer's book? Oh, I, I have, a, I, another, another party away, favor. Uh, another party <laughs> favor. It's, it's like, kids' parties with the plastic bag with yeah, all the chopsticks that we don't want. Um, uh, this is um, a, a tiny little easily readable booklet by Nancy Summers. She directs the writing program at Harvard. And this book, Responding to Student Writers, is based on a longitudinal study they did of students over the four years at Harvard gauging what they took to be effective response to their writing. Um, at every turn, and I love that Summers does this, she'll in effect pause to say, okay, so what does this really mean in terms of what you should say to a student? And she'll give you those chunks of um, borrowable uh, uh, pieces of advice. So clearly we have enough every, for everybody to grab one of those. I was wondering what all that stuff stacked up on the table. Yeah. <laughs> and, and all I, good stuff. I suppose we should you know, throw in a thanks to the good folks at Bedford St. Martins because they're the people from whom I've cached these copies. <laughs> I also have, just while we're on the subject, um, if you're interested, a, a, a short bibliography of um, essays that I find interesting and helpful and even provocative about grading and assessment. Um, I also have copies of the WPA, that's Writing Program Administrators, um, outcome statement, which is, in effect, our field taking a shot at saying, Here's what students ought to emerge from a year of college writing with. And I've ended that sentence with a preposition, which is fine, which by is the way. Which is fine, yes. yes. <laughs> it's fine, by the way. Um, yes, it is. It is. And, That's and a so, and, and so, right, there's the famous Winston Churchill line when a woman at a party cautioned him about having ended a sentence with the preposition, and he replies, Madam, that is the type of errant pedantry up with which I shall not put. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question.
question? I, I was just wondering, uh, um, I understand that at AU we're doing some examining of writing, mm -hmm. and there's 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 a process of meetings and you know have, yep. and 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 I wondered um, when that the outcomes of that might I I think the come along I think the what? aim is to have um, by the end of this academic year a report that will in effect mirror the report that emerged last fall on quantitative literacy. Not that the issues are the same, they're, they're, they're not of course, but in terms of the scope and the form of what, what that outcome will be, that'll be the model of, of what uh, is being hoped for. So, so it won't so be a change in Well, and keep, so keep in mind, one of the, after the quantitative literacy report came out, there are actual changes being made because of that. You know, there's going to, there is almost certainly going to be a quantitative literacy requirement for all students who are graduating from the university. Um, so, um, and different courses are being devised as a result of that across the university, you know, in different units. Um, so, so that report had, it, effect, it affected changes across the university. So I would suppose that, you know, this one would too, probably of different types. Yes, yeah. one, I've been on, on all these different committees. Yeah. And Donna, correct me if I'm wrong. One of the key questions is how to move writing forward. That nobody doubts that what happens in college writing is good. Okay. The question is how to move that forward, and should there be something at the other end? In other words, when students are are seniors in their major fields, should there be something, either part of a capstone or something separate, that's a culmination of the writing skills that they need to have before they exit the university? Is that is that? Yeah, that's a fair so that, that's sort of the summary yeah. of where those discussions have gone. <coughs> okay, and what Lacey said before, just to summarize some of this, the mindset of faculty and the way we view writing is what's so critical. That we're not looking at it as a gotcha. Okay, you can't write, you can't do this. It's how to move students' writing forward in every single class, even if it's a little bit in one course and a lot in another course that students are constantly getting the same message that learning to write well is important, it takes time, it gradually improves over time, and that all of us, to some extent, need to be involved in the process. I hope we got that recorded. That was a terrific permission. Thank you, Marilyn. Well, thank you. I'm really glad that um, not only did you get some really practical ideas Thank you very, very much. Uh, try some of these things out.